Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Lin, and welcome to our UCLA Esophageal Insights Zoom series. Today, we'll be talking about a review of esophageal pH testing. So this is just a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. We're going to talk a little bit about reflux symptoms, evaluation and testing algorithm, indications for pH testing, measurements that we look at in pH testing, and also different types of pH testing. So as we all know, uh, reflux symptom is very prevalent in our practice. Uh, we see a lot of patients with reflux symptoms. So this was a recent survey of 72,000 people in the US and two out of five people um, in that survey, they found that two out of five people have um, had some sort of reflux symptoms, heartburn or regurgitation in the past. Uh, one out of three people had reflux symptoms just in the past week. And one out of two people um, who are taking daily acid suppressing medication, so daily PPIs for their reflux symptoms have had persistent heartburn or regurgitation for at least two days in the past week. So very common. And we define refractory reflux symptom as um, symptoms of heartburn or regurgitation not responding to PPI therapy for at least 12 weeks. So this is something that I'm sure you all are pretty familiar with. Um, these are some typical and atypical symptoms of acid reflux. So typical symptoms include uh, heartburn, regurgitation. Atypical symptoms can include chest pain, belching, nausea, epigastric pain, bloating, or laryngeal symptoms. There are also extraesophageal symptoms and findings uh, that can happen in GERD as well. So this can include globus, coughing, asthma, pulmonary fibrosis, pharyngitis, sinusitis, recurrent otitis media, and dental erosions. So what is the algorithm for us to evaluate and test these patients with reflux symptoms? So someone comes to you in the office with reflux symptoms, usually we do an empiric PPI trial. And if that person has alarm symptoms, then we proceed to do an upper endoscopy. So here's the data on um, uh, the empiric PPI trial. So in someone with typical reflux symptoms and you put them on an empiric PPI trial, and this can be PPI once or twice daily, usually you wanna counsel them to take it appropriately 30 to 60 minutes before a meal. And uh, from prior studies, this has been shown to be about 70 to 80% sensitive and 40 to 60% specific. And in prior studies, uh, an empiric PPI trial has been shown to be cost effective. Um, and PPIs generally are more effective in treating patients with actual esophagitis or an abnormal acid exposure time. So, you know, people with actual GERD. And PPIs are generally less effective for patients with atypical symptoms or normal acid exposure times. And there's also uh, been no evidence for to support changing a patient to different PPIs. Like if they haven't responded to something like omeprazole, changing them to um, you know esomeprazole or pantoprazole, there's really been no evidence to, to support that. So you just have to pick one PPI and try it. Um, and there's also been no evidence for increasing um, beyond the twice a day dosing for PPIs. So you know, again, you've tried empiric PPI trial, what happens after? Well, if a patient's symptom resolve with the empiric PPI trial, you want to do a step-down approach to find the, the lowest therapeutic dosage for that patient. And you can incorporate, you know, H2 receptor agonists to try to get them off of PPI or decrease uh, the amount of PPI that they need. So these are all strategies that you can employ to get them down to their lowest therapeutic dosage. If their symptoms don't resolve, then generally you want to do an upper endoscopy if that hasn't been done already. So on upper endoscopy, there are certain things that we look for that are, are what we consider conclusive evidence for GERD. So, and this includes severe esophagitis, grade LA grade C or D esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, or a peptic stricture. Everything outside of this on an upper endoscopy is really not considered to be diagnostic evidence of GERD. So one thing to note is that the, 
you know, the increasing popularity of uh, empiric PPI trials have decreased the likelihood of finding reflux esophagitis on an upper endoscopy. So, you know, as we, I'm sure you have all um, seen is that when you do an upper endoscopy on someone with reflux symptoms, um, you know, generally that upper endoscopy is normal. It's, it's in a very small percentage of patients where you actually find evidence of severe reflux esophagitis. And this has actually been looked at in studies as well. So in this study, uh, with about 700 patients with a partial response to PPI therapy, only about 27% of them had some sort of esophageal mucosal break on that upper endoscopy. And among these 27% of patients, this was the specific breakdown of the different LA grades. So as you can see here, the majority of patients, 90% of patients had LA grade A and B esophagitis, which are not diagnostic for GERD. And only about 10% of patients had more severe esophagitis, LA grade C and D, um, which were diagnostic for GERD. And so overall, um, you know, an, an EGD has very low sensitivity and high specificity for diagnosis of GERD. So most of the time, you know, in patients with reflux, the upper endoscopy is probably going to be normal. The other thing that I wanted to bring up here is that sometimes people will take esophageal biopsies on their upper endoscopy and it may show a few eosinophils. Um, and you know, oftentimes this is thought to be suggestive of GERD. Um, and it is true that reflux can cause um, uh, eosinophils to show up in the esophagus. Usually esophageal biopsies you know, in the normal esophagus should not, show, should not have any eosinophils. But I just wanted to make a note here that having a few eosinophils in the, on your esophageal biopsies is not in itself diagnostic for GERD. So this is um, kind of the, the pH testing algorithm um, that has been uh, supported by the major guidelines. So just to run through it here, you have someone, a patient with persistent symptoms suggestive of, suggestive of GERD, and you're going to go down one of two, path, uh, one of two pathways. So there, uh, most people are going to fall into this uh, left-hand blue side. So these are patients with either an upper endoscopy without definitive evidence of GERD um, or patients with atypical reflux symptoms um, or patients who are getting evaluated for a, a potential anti-reflux surgery or patients with recurrent or persistent symptoms on PPI therapy um, or um, uh, persistent symptoms after some sort of anti-reflux procedure. So, you know, in, in these patients, you really want to do a definitive pH test off of PPI therapy or off of acid suppression. And um, you can do the pH testing either through wire-based, so catheter-based pH tests or wireless um, or wireless pH monitoring like Bravo or a 24-hour pH impedance test. So um, any of these testing uh, types of pH tests is fine. We're going to talk about these different uh, types of pH tests in, uh, in the future slides. But the important thing is in these patients, you want, you want to do pH testing off of acid suppression. And then in patients um, with reflux uh, symptoms, um, if they have already previously had an upper endoscopy with definitive signs of GERD, so LA grade C or D esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, or peptic stricture, or if they've actually already had prior pH testing that was positive, um, but they're still having reflux, they're still having symptoms despite being on acid suppression, these patients, you want to do a 24-hour pH impedance study on PPI twice a day. So a note that I want to make here was that uh, testing off of PPI results in generally more symptoms reported during the test and thus would uh, generate a higher yield for the reflux symptom association analysis. Um, and really for these patients, um, you know, without definitive evidence of GERD or uh, uh, 
the question that you're trying to answer with pH testing off of PPI therapy is really, does this patient truly have GERD and is it the cause of their symptoms? For patients on this right side here, the question that you're trying to answer is in a patient with already proven GERD, why is the treatment failing and is there ongoing reflux, either acidic or non-acidic? So we were talking in the last slide, basically these are some of the indications for uh, pursuing pH, esophageal pH testing. I wanted to go into um, the atypical symptoms and the anti-reflux surgery part a, a little bit more in terms of data. So for atypical symptoms, these are some of the common extraesophageal atypical symptoms or findings that we see um, in patients who present to our clinic. So chronic cough, globus, belching, LPR, um, or also called laryngopharyngeal reflux, pulmonary fibrosis. I bolded chronic cough and LPR here because these are, are very common things that we see in clinic. Um, and LPR is where they, um, you know, where ENT does the laryng uh, uh, laryngoscopy and they're seeing vocal cord erythema and edema. And these are just some of the points that I want to make for LPR. A is that it has very low specificity for GERD and LPR can be seen commonly in even healthy volunteers. All of the studies have been, that have been done in LPR are pretty small studies, but in a small prospective study of patients with laryngeal symptoms and LPR, pH impedance testing off of PPI actually confirmed GERD in less than 50% of patients. So a lot of these patients with LPR, they don't actually have GERD. In small prospective studies with LPR patients, laryngoscopic findings also did not predict response to PPI therapy. And also what's been seen in prior studies is that the interrater reliability and agreement between different otolaryngologists for la uh, laryngoscopic findings suggestive of LPR is really suboptimal. So there is a lot of interrater uh, variability. A couple of other notes um, uh, about kind of uh, evaluation for anti-reflux or before anti-reflux procedure and why, does, why it's important for us to get pH testing before considering anti-reflux procedure. So up to 50% of patients referred for further evaluation of reflux symptoms did not actually have objective evidence of GERD. So if you just referred patients for anti-reflux procedures based off of symptoms alone, then up to 50% of those patients could not actually, you know, may not necessarily even have GERD um, and may not need that anti-reflux procedure. So it's just something to take into consideration. Um, in prior studies, abnormal acid exposure time, reflux symptom association scores have been shown to predict symptom improvement from anti-reflux therapy, including surgery. The reason why I highlighted the abnormal acid exposure time here is that generally, acid exposure time or abnormal acid exposure time is always usually the most reliable and the best predictor for response to therapy. There is limited data on whether adding impedance to pH monitoring facilitates selecting patients for anti-reflux surgery. And there's even less data on indication for surgery based on number of reflux episodes alone. So if you have someone, let's say, who get a pH impedance study and they have normal acid exposure time um, and normal reflux symptom association scores, but you know, on the impedance part, they just have an increased number of reflux episodes, you know, I would be very hesitant to refer that patient for anti-reflux procedure based on that alone. So for our esophageal pH testing, what are some of the things that we measure? And these are, these are common measurements that are measured in um, all of the variety, different types of pH testing. So there's always an acid exposure time that's reported, and this is really the percentage of time with pH less than four. There are also different reflux symptom association scores that are usually reported. This can include symptom index, symptom association probability, symptom sensitivity index, um, which is not often used now. 
Um, and then it also usually reports number of reflux episodes, and there's also usually a Demeser score that's reported. So the Demeser score is just a composite score that takes into account these six factors. Um, so the total number of episodes of reflux, total acid exposure time, upright acid exposure time, supine acid exposure time, number of reflux episodes longer than five minutes, and longest reflux episode. And it, and it generates this composite score. So using a combination of the acid exposure time and the reflux symptom association um, score, you can generally phenotype the patients into one of these four categories. So if someone has an abnormal acid exposure time and positive reflux symptom association, generally that person is considered to have strong evidence for GERD. If someone has a pause, uh, abnormal acid exposure time and no negative reflux symptom association, then they're still considered to have good evidence for GERD. And this is because the reflux symptom association scores are not that sensitive, um, as we'll discuss in the next few slides. If someone has a, a normal acid exposure time, but positive reflux sym symptom association, then you would consider this patient to potentially having reflux hypersensitivity. And if a patient has normal acid exposure time and negative reflux symptom association, then really for that patient, there is no evidence of GERD. So I wanted to go into a little bit about reflux symptom association scores, how they're cut calculated. Um, so one common uh, score that you'll see is the symptom index. And this is basically the percentage of reflux related symptom episodes. And how it's calculated is um, dividing the number of reflux related symptom episodes um, divided by the total number of symptom episodes. And you basically multiply by 100 to get a percentage and anything higher than 50% is considered to be positive. So the shortcoming of a symptom index is um, it doesn't incorporate the total number of reflux events in its calculation. So technically a high symptom index value may be due to a patient having many reflux episodes and just, you know, they randomly push the event button once at the right time and you can get a, a high symptom index score. So there is also the symptom sensitivity index, which is basically the percentage of symptom related reflux episodes. And this is calculated by the number of symptom related reflux episodes dividing by the, divided by the total number of reflux episodes. Um, and anything greater than 10% is considered to be positive. The, um, the shortcoming of this is that it doesn't incorporate the total number of symptom episodes. Um, so it's more likely to be positive when the number of symptom episodes are high. Um, and the symptom, I just brought this up because sometimes you may see this reported, but the symptom sensitivity index is really not used very often nowadays. Oftentimes it's um, usually we use symptom index um, and the SAP. So to try to get around these shortcomings, then people came up with the symptom association probability or the SAP. And this is a statistical likelihood that the patient's symptoms are related to reflux. And the calculation for the SAP is a little bit more complicated than the calculations for the symptom index and the um, SSI. So how they calculate the SAP is basically they take, let's say a 24 hour um, pH impedance study and they divide it up into two minute intervals. And for each of those two minute intervals, they basically see, is there a reflux event that happened? And was there a symptom episode that was reported? And after they kind of um, look through all of those two minute intervals, you can, you can establish a two by two table. And using that data, you can then apply a statistical method to basically get a p-value. And the p-value is a reflection that, um, you know, what is the, uh, what is the um, likelihood that the association seen between the reflux events and the symptoms uh, happen by chance. So the SAP is actually one minus the P. So 
anything that is an SAP that is 95% or greater is considered to be a positive association. So let's say if someone has a um, SAP of 97%, right? Um, what this means is that there is a 97% chance that the association, the positive association seen between the reflux event and the symptom did not happen by chance alone. So the SAP score really um, accounts for all relevant observations, including symptom episodes and reflux episodes, and, and it applies a statistical method. So what are some shortcomings of the reflux symptom association? So one thing to um, note is that the original validation studies for these reflux symptom association scores actually um, uh, did not study patients who had failed PPI therapy before testing. So the initial group of patients who are studied don't really are not really the same group of patients who we use pH testing on now, right? Because now when we do pH testing, it's usually in patients who have tried empiric PPI um, therapy and are still having persistent symptoms. So kind of the group of patients are that were initially studied are a little bit different from the type of patients who we are using these pH testing on. The other important thing to uh, kind of remember is that the reflux symptom association score is only going to be as accurate as what the patient reports, right? It really depends on the patient pressing that button and reporting that symptom. So it's very much operator dependent. And this was an interesting study done by Vasey's group um, where they basically, you know, had patients do a 24 hour pH impedance study but during that study, the patients are also hooked up to an acoustic monitoring device that actually detects the actual cough in real time and re records that as well. And it's um, temporally um, synced with the 24-hour pH impedance. So um, you can see when the cough actually happened and also when the patient actually pressed the button that report to report the symptom of cough. And you can see here... Um, Basically on the y-axis, this is the percentage of cough events missed by the subject. On the x-axis here, you have different time intervals. So this is basically, you know, saying, um, you know, did the patient press that button to report that symptom of cough within one minute of the cough actually happening? Um, or within two minutes of the cough actually happening, or within five minutes of the cough actually happening. And not surprisingly, you can see here the longer time interval that's used, um, there is then less percentage of cough events that are, um, uh, that are missing, right? Um, but I think what is surprising about this data is that is the overall high percentage number for you know, um, cough events that are actually missed by the subject. So, you know, if we're taking, for example, if we're taking a look at the two minute interval, right, which is, you know, asking the question, did the, did the subject actually press that button within two minutes of the actual cough happening, then 82% of those patients actually, um, or 82% of uh, cough events were actually not reported. So a very high percentage. And they also, this is a, a graph representing the duration of the whole study, so of the whole 24 hours. And what you can see here is that this discrepancy between what was actually recorded by the acoustic monitoring device and what the patient actually reported, this discrepancy actually exists for the whole duration of the study. It's not just happening during a certain time of the day or after eating or, or whatnot. Um, it's, it's actually persistent throughout the study. So um, the kind of, you know, long story short is that patients are not very good about actually reporting the symptom in real time and that they, they may have, um, you know, symptoms and oftentimes they may just forget to report it completely. And this happens at a very high percentage or high rate. So this is, this is an example of the uh, reflux symptom association scores are reported. So for example, this patient is 
reporting burning pain in the mouth. And there is, for this study, there were two pH, um, pH sensors that were used, one proximal channel, one distal channel. Um, and there is a symptom index and SAP that is reported for each of those pH sensors. And earlier studies have suggested that neither the symptom index nor the SAP was optimal in predicting response to therapy, whether it's to medications or, or anti-reflux procedure. And in previous studies, it also has been shown that um, the symptom index and the SAP score may be actually more useful and more reproducible and clinically relevant in patients, especially with high acid exposure time which in that study defined as pH less than four, more than 10% of the time. So the general gist is that, you know, generally these reflux symptom association scores are probably more useful and more um, accurate, especially in patients who actually have GERD and kind of the more severe and um, the more severe the GERD is, it's the more accurate these reflux symptom association scores are. So I want to go into kind of discussing the different type of pH tests that are available. So there are wire-based pH tests and wireless pH tests. So the wire-based pH test includes catheter-based pH tests. So these are um, pH tests without impedance and then also the impedance pH tests. So all of these wire-based pH tests are done through a transnasal catheter. They're usually placed um, with the distal pH sensor about five centimeters above the proximal border of the manometric lower esophageal sphincter. And they, these tests can be 24, uh, 24 or 48 hours. And there are many different types of uh, pH or pH impedance catheters available. So um, these catheters can be with or without impedance. They can be single or dual pH sensors. Um, or you can have some of these catheters may have a gastric pH sensor, which we oftentimes don't use. So what are the pros and cons of um, wire-based pH tests? So the pros is that wire-based pH testing does not require sedation. You do not have to place it with an endoscopy. Um, and it can be done in patients on anticoagulation or, for example, patients with varices. And um, the cons is that in order to know where to place the pH test, it requires an esophageal manometry to establish a lower esophageal sphincter location. And um, especially with the, with the esophageal manometry placement part, it can cause nasopharyngeal pain, epistaxis, or just having a wire in that can cause, also cause symptoms of dysphagia. And there are studies that have shown that wire-based pH testing can cause patients to restrict their level of activity, limit their oral intake, all of which can increase the likelihood of a false negative pH test. Swallowing and body movement may also alter the catheter position, leading to fluctuations in pH measurements. So this is an example of the um, result of a catheter-based pH test. Um, so this is pH without impedance. Uh, for this catheter that was used, there was a proximal pH sensor and a distal pH sensor. Um, and this line here basically indicates pH of four, and anything that falls below here is a reflux event. And um, generally, I like to, I think it's good to always take a look at this global overview of the data just to make sure there are no weird artifacts, um, that the, you know, the pH sensor hasn't accidentally moved into the stomach, things like that. Um, and then if you look at the top bar here, um, this is what the patient also um, recorded. So basically they've marked this blue bar here, marked when they were lying flat or in, when they're in a supine position. Um, the green bar here indicates when they're eating a meal. So, you know, any reflux event that happens during meal times are excluded. And then um, the vertical lines are when they've report, the vertical gray lines are when they've uh, re reported a symptom. And this is 
um, an example of the numbers that are reported um, for the results of a catheter-based pH test. So this is this was a 24-hour um, pH test. And usually what you're looking at is the acid exposure time, right? And this is there's an acid exposure time for the proximal pH sensor and also for the distal pH sensor. And then there's also the composite Demeester score that's reported. So, you know, I think oftentimes people think that pH test is very black and white. It's either positive or negative. But I think if you look more into the data, you'll realize there are more, actually more gray areas than you would think. Um, just from prior validation studies, generally in, you know, an acid exposure time or total acid exposure time that's less than 4% is considered normal. And then kind of 4 to 6% is a little bit of a gray zone, but generally acid exposure time less than 6% is also considered to be likely normal. And anything greater than 6% is generally considered abnormal. The specific cutoff may vary a little bit depending on which validation study you're using to um, define your normal. Um, but generally, this is, the, uh, this is the general ballpark for what you're thinking about for um, when to consider an acid exposure time normal versus abnormal. And just a few notes on acid exposure times. So the dual sensor pH monitoring test was proposed to evaluate both proximal and distal reflux burden in patients, especially with extra esophageal reflux symptoms. But um, the important thing to note is that the proximal acid exposure time actually has poor sensitivity and reproducibility. And there's actually no, um, you know, there's no great consensus on the pH criteria for defining pathologic reflux at the proximal esophagus. So, you know, the consensus on what's considered an abnormal acid exposure time in that proximal pH sensor is just not as good um, and defined as for the as for the acid exposure time in the distal pH sensor. But generally, um, you know, and for the proximal pH sensor, anything that is less than an acid exposure time of less than 1% is considered normal. 1% to 2% is a little bit of a gray area, but um, definitely anything greater than 2% is considered abnormal in the proximal pH sensor. And then what is kind of the meaning or um, kind of uh, uh, relevance of having abnormal acid ex exposure time in different positions. So upright versus supine versus combined, um, having abnormal acid exposure time in both upright and supine position. So someone with upright only reflux um, or basically abnormal acid exposure time only in the upright position, this is also considered diurnal reflux. And this is the most common pattern that we see. And this is thought to be uh, due to frequent transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations. When someone has both as abnormal acid exposure time in both upright and supine position, generally it's considered that those patients have more severe reflux. And those patients may also have an incompetent lower esophageal sphincter. Having reflux only in the supine position is definitely um, more unusual and not usually seen. So I think if you, there's no great explanation for why that, why we see that in some people. Um, but I think, you know, for those patients, you really have to kind of clinically correlate. And if it doesn't make sense with their symptoms or with their clinical picture, I would say for those patients, you can consider repeating a, a, a pH test. Um, there have also been some studies in the past that have shown that preoperative abnormal acid exposure time in both upright and supine positions may um, have higher, those patients may have higher likelihood of recurrent pathological acid exposure and esophagitis following this infundoplication and the need for reoperation. Although some of these results have been conflicting in the data. So, but I think, you know, the general gist is that patients with both upright and supine reflux generally are thought to have more severe reflux and they may have, they may be a little bit more refractory to therapy. So the next type of test I wanted to discuss was impedance pH test. And this is also called multi-channel intraluminal impedance 
monitoring combined with pH metry. And um, as you can see here, um, basically this is the pH impedance catheter. It also has that distal pH sensor that you want to place five centimeters above the proximal border of the lower esophageal sphincter. And then on this, some of the pH impedance catheters will also have a more proximal pH sensor. And then um, you also have these um, impedance sensors that are um, positioned throughout the catheter at these, at these distances. So currently a pH impedance test is considered kind of the gold standard for detection of reflux episodes due to its ability to detect acidic and weakly or non-acidic reflux events. So just going into a little bit about impedance of the GI tract at its contents, this is how we can um, you know, measure impedance um, and evaluate the bolus on a pH impedance study. So basically, impedance of air is very high, right? As you can see here, impedance of food or um, gastric or duodenal refluxate is low. And the impedance of organ wall is about 10 to 30 times higher than impedance of the transported contents. So because of these differences in the impedance, this allows us to actually see the movement of the bolus. So the low impedance of the bolus, which also has high ionic content, makes it easily distinguishable from its surroundings. And I would just encourage you, if you want to learn more about impedance and other studies using impedance, um, you know, a great um, video to look at is um, a, a lecture given by Dr. Conklin on impedance of the esophagus that's now um, available on YouTube as well. So this is an example of a reflux event that we see on an impedance pH test. So, you know, here you have the, you know, each line here is data from the impedance sensors. And then at the bottom here, you also have the pH sensor that's located five centimeters above the lower esophageal sphincter. And as you can um, see here, we usually define uh, a, a reflux event um, as a at least 50% drop in impedance that happens rapidly. And as you can see here, there's a sudden drop in impedance and you can also see the direction of this impedance drop, and it's actually going upwards toward the mouth. So this tells you that this is not like a bolus that someone is swallowing, right? This is a bolus that's coming up from the stomach upwards toward the mouth, so that's consistent with a reflux event. And you can also see here that there was a corresponding drop in the, in the pH, and the pH falls below four, so again, consistent with an acidic reflux event. And nowadays with our impedance pH test, you can, the program can translate that impedance data into color. So um, basically air is black. So something with high impedance is black, low impedance is white. Um, and when you translate that data into color, you can see the, um, the reflux event here pretty clearly. Um, if you zoomed in more, you would see that again, the direction of that impedance drop is actually going upwards like this consistent with a reflux event. And you can see here um, for this particular pH impedance catheter that we use, this was the distal pH sensor and this was the proximal pH sensor. And you can see here in the distal pH sensor, there was a corresponding drop in the pH to below four. Um, and you know, as the reflux event ended, kind of the pH became more and more normal. And the proximal pH sensor, um, remain normal during this reflux event. This is an example of uh, the result that gets reported with a pH impedance study. So again, this is a 24-hour pH impedance study. We're looking at the acid exposure time, just like with our other with our other pH tests. And there is this the Meester score that gets reported um, as well. So in this example, the the pH uh, the, the acid exposure time was abnormal um, in the upright position, making the total acid exposure time abnormal. And the Demeester score was also positive. And then on a pH impedance study, um, generally you're also gonna have basically the total or the number of reflux events that gets reported. And usually it gets divided into a, 
uh, acidic, weakly acidic, or non-acidic reflux events, depending on the pH. So generally, um, pH less than four is considered acidic, pH between four to seven is considered weakly acidic, and pH of greater than seven is considered non-acidic. And again, just like what we talked about earlier, if the acid exposure time is normal and just the reflux um, num event number is abnormal, then you know, I would be very cautious about saying this person definitively has GERD and referring that person for anti-reflux surgery. Because again, just the purely the number of reflux episodes alone is not a great predictor of treatment response. Um, uh, so there are some, you know, limitations to pH impedance testing as well that you have to take into account. So sometimes patients can have low baseline impedance that interferes with your pH impedance test result. And this, a low baseline pH impedance can be seen in someone with impaired esophageal mucosal integrity, um, for example, in patients with esophagitis or Barrett's esoph esophagus eosinophilic esophagitis and in anyone with an esophageal motility disorder. So that where they may have stasis in the esophagus. So this can include patients with achalasia, absent paracelsis, ineffective esophageal motility. Um, and this low baseline impedance can basically decrease the sensitivity of reflux recognition and just overall make it difficult to interpret that pH impedance study. And when they actually, um, there was a study looking at this um, where they looked at 2,800 pH impedance studies. And, you know, this doesn't happen that often. So at least, you know, in this study, only 1.4% or 38 patients um, had low baseline impedance that made the study difficult to interpret. And when they looked at those 38 patients, this was the breakdown for what they saw was the cause of the low baseline impedance. So, um, you know, most patients had some sort of esophageal dysmotility, whether it's ineffective esophageal motility or achalasia, um, scleroderma patients with, um, with esophageal aperistalsis. Um, and then 16% uh, of the patients had GERD. So, you know, this, this is presuming they had some sort of esophagitis um, maybe that's also giving them that low baseline impedance. And then 8% of the patients just had no clear reason why they had low baseline impedance. And the other thing that I wanted to um, just note for you here is that in the impedance pH study can also be a, a good study to do in your patients with belching. Um, and this is because based on impedance, you can differentiate between gastric belching and supragastric belching, depending on kind of the direction of the impedance change. So again, impedance of air is very high. So when someone has um, a air in the esophagus, you're gonna see a rise or a sudden rise in the impedance. And by looking at kind of the direction of this rise, you can get a sense, is it coming from the stomach or um, is it, you know, flowing into the esophagus really fast, kind of from the mouth. And this can help you differentiate between the different types of belching. And because impedance, you know, you can, you can evaluate the different types of belching also on an esophageal manometry, but, and usually when we are evaluating a belching patient with esophageal manometry, we would kind of leave them in the room um, with the manometry catheter in place for 10 to 15 minutes to basically see if they belch during that time. So that can also help us differentiate um, uh, between a supragastric belch and a gastric belch. But, um, you know, some people don't belch that often. So you may not be able to catch that belching on esophageal manometry. So, you know, for those patients, a 24 hour pH impedance would give you just longer monitoring time and uh, maybe a good uh, adjunctive test. So the other type of pH monitoring is the wireless pH monitoring, also called Bravo pH test. And this can be done either um, 48 hours or 96 hours. It can be you know, all off of acid suppression or often on acid suppression or on acid suppression, however you want to do it. Um, and the, the pros of 
Bravo or wireless pH testing is that it can give you an extended recording time, which can increase the diagnostic yield for both identifying abnormal acid exposure time and for calculation of those reflux symptom association scores. Um, it is more comfortable, so it may allow for more normal diet and activities. And the cons of the wireless pH monitoring is that um, some patients may have potential chest pain after the procedure, especially in patients who you suspect may have esophageal hypersensitivity. So, you know, especially for someone who you suspect with functional chest pain or, you know, especially patients with fibromyalgia, you really want to counsel those patients on um, potential chest pain after the procedure because, um, and that, you know, if the pain is too severe, you may have to bring them back for, you know, resedate them, bring them back for repeat endoscopy to remove the Bravo. Um, a Bravo pH test, because it has to be placed at the time of an endoscopy, usually, generally it's associated with higher cost and it does require that sedation that comes with the upper endoscopy. There are um, studies that have been done where they place the Bravo without sedation, without endoscopy, but you know, generally nowadays it's considered just to be a little bit more safe and generally most people do Bravo testing placement um, via endoscopy. So for, so when do we, when will we use a wireless pH test? Um, so you want to consider a wireless pH test uh, if someone, you don't think someone is going to tolerate the transnasal catheter um, or if the catheter-based pH test or impedance pH test um, is negative despite high suspicion for GERD. So, um, you know, that way, it, it, if you feel like 24 hours of testing is, is maybe is giving you a false negative, it may not be enough. You can then do the wireless pH monitoring for longer duration of testing. You also want to consider it in patients who have very infrequent symptoms um, or if they have a lot of day to day variation in their esophageal symptoms. Uh, some of the contraindications to wireless pH monitoring is if they're on anticoagulation um, or if they have some sort of underlying uh, bleeding diastasis esophageal varices, severe esophagitis, esophageal stricture, esophageal diverticula, especially in that area where you think you're going to place the Bravo um, or any sort of bowel obstruction. It's also contraindicated in patients with pacemakers or implantable cardiac defibrillators. The capsule also contains a small magnet. So Generally, we tell patients no MRIs within 30 days. And then um, there is also a little bit of nickel in there. So it's contraindicated in patients with a nickel allergy. So this is an example um, of the result from a wireless pH test. Um, so, you know, this line is again indicative of pH of four, and anything below that is a reflux event. Um, and same things, the patient marks whether they're supine when they're eating a meal, and they also mark their symptoms. And as you can already kind of see here from this test, just from this global overview, there are a lot of reflux events. Um, so this person probably had a positive uh, or abnormal acid exposure time. And this is um, an example of the results. So um, it's a 48 hour wireless pH test, um, and the data um, can be reported out day by day. And what you're looking at, again, is the acid exposure time. And this was a positive study. As you can see here, there was an elevated or abnormal acid exposure time um, for both upright and supine. And what you can see here, and again, in cor uh, corresponding to that, there's also elevated Demeter score on both days. And what you can see here is that, um, and this has been shown in prior studies as well, is that there is a lot of day-to-day -day variation in terms of the acid exposure time, right? This person on day one, um, you know, just didn't have, uh, had an abnormal acid exposure time, but not that high. And then day two had a lot more um, uh, reflux events um, on day two in general, in both upright and supine position.
So this is another, I wanted to show this example as well. This is kind of what you would see if the Bravo prematurely fell off into the stomach and enter the small bowel. So this is why it's important to kind of, you know, before looking at the data, you kind of want to look at this global overview um, just to make sure that something like this didn't happen and that that's not affecting your data. So, you know, as you can see here, these were some reflux events. And then this was when the Bravo fell into the stomach, which is why this part was just all, you know, acidic with pH less than four. And then when the Bravo capsule um, fell into the small bowel, it became, um, the pH became higher. And generally in the small bowel, the pH in the proximal small bowel is, is about 6.5. It gets more and more basic um, or less acidic as the capsule progresses through the small intestine. So usually by the terminal ileum, you know, the pH is usually um, in the high sevens. So, and you can kind of see that being reflected here is that the pH gets progressively higher as the pH capsule progresses through the small intestine. So what you can do then usually for these studies, you just exclude this part of the data. Um, basically that that part of the data after the capsule has fallen off into the stomach so you can make an appropriate interpretation. So just a few words on how pH testing can change your management. Um, basically, these are some of the things that I think about um, based on what I'm seeing on the pH test. So if you have someone with a positive pH test and the appropriate clinical picture, right? So I think the important thing is, you know, you have to combine all of these data together to see if they all match up. So if you have someone with a positive pH test and the appropriate clinical symptoms, clinical picture, um, in those patients that you know allows you to discuss maybe anti-reflux procedure or surgery versus long-term acid suppression. And I think if someone doesn't want an anti-reflux procedure, you know, this gives you kind of more evidence to support putting them on longer term acid suppression, such as a PPI. Um, and if they have a negative pH test, um, this kind of allows you to, um, or gives you better evidence for discussing esophageal or visceral hypersensitivity, maybe functional um, reflux or functional heartburn. And, um, and you can then consider treatment for the esophageal hypersensitivity. For example, treatment with a low dose tricyclic antidepressant. Um, and for patients where you see on the pH test, let's say if they have upright reflux, reflux only, then um, generally it's thought that those patients have more frequent transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. And let's say if they're not responding to PPI therapy, you can consider the use of baclofen in those patients, which um, you know, can decrease the number of those transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxations. And in patients with more also supine reflux, you know, those are the patients where I really counsel them on some lifestyle changes, including head of bed elevation, including the use of a wedge pillow, which can be much more effective than use of just, let's say, two or three pillows that, you know, oftentimes ends up just elevating their neck without elevating their chest. Um, you can tell them to avoid eating late, avoiding meals two to three hours before bedtime, um, and uh, avoid late evening fatty meals. So you just want to kind of keep that stomach as empty as possible before they lie down. You can also consider adding on um, kind of an acid suppressing medication with more of a barrier effect, such as Gaviscon at bedtime um, to kind of try to prevent physical um, regurgitant from coming up into the esophagus. So overall, just some take-home points for patients with incomplete response to PPI therapy and unproven GERD, you really want to consider pH testing off of acid suppression. So, you know, and, and the important thing to remember is that this is most of your patients. So most of your patients who you're getting a pH test, um, usually it should be done off of P, uh, acid suppression. The other way you can think about it or remember is that Basically, um, you should only do a pH testing on acid suppression for really patients with uh, an, an incomplete response to PPI therapy and already proven GERD.
And the proven GERD is defined as having either LA grade C or D esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, or peptic stricture. Um, abnormal acid exposure time is also the most reliable and reproducible measurement and the best predicts therapeutic outcomes. So, um, you know, I think that's really the main thing that you're looking at. And for other things like the reflux symptom association, I think you really have to overall taken, or you have to take into account multiple variables, right? All of these variables together, the acid exposure time, reflux symptom association, the clinical symptoms to see kind of if it all adds up, if it all makes sense to really decide on what is causing the patient's symptoms. I think it, you can't really just take one thing um, into consideration on its own. I think you know, you can't just say there is, let's say, positive reflux symptom association. So therefore, you know, this is most likely or an increased number of reflux events on impedance alone. I think you can't take those data in isolation um, to say that, okay, this person definitely has GERD. I think, you know, the best idea is to take all of these factors into consideration to see if it makes sense for your patient's symptoms. So that's it. And thank you everyone for your time.